Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us and is always an honor to work with, we have Cheryl Myers. She is the Chief, um, Chief of Scientific Affairs and Europharma Educator, speaking on the topic of Achieve Optimal Breast Health. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for being here with us tonight. Thank you. I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be able to visit with you, even if it's virtually. So, so glad to be here. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, you have some wonderful information to share, and um, which is um, in honor of uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And um, what um, what are some um, facts that um, um, well, isn't it? Isn't it that uh, men can also get breast cancer? I had heard yes, that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, as we get started very quickly, um, the way that I am attached to natural health is uh, my very first degree is in nursing. So I am a registered nurse. And I also am something called an advanced practice oncology certified nurse, uh, which means that I went the extra over and above to help take care of cancer patients. So I've always had a big place in my heart for working with cancer. And then I moved from um, oncology and cancer treatment into hospice care. And hospice care is home care for the terminally ill. These are individuals uh, who are not expected to live more than six months. And my main group were individuals with cancer, although I did, uh, this was a few years ago when we didn't have such good treatment for AIDS. I did have my uh, also an AIDS caseload and also in-stage heart disease. So it was a very gratifying way to work with health. And that's actually what piqued my interest in natural health and integrative health was because my patients were always asking me questions about what about this rice powder or what about this ABC diet or what about this creative, you know, whatever. They had all these different things that I knew nothing about. So um, I went to Purdue, which is a good school, go Boilermakers, uh, but it's a very rigid school. So when I went to school, it was very, uh, you either it was my way or the highway. There was no straying off the path. It was mainstream medicine all the way and the rest was voodoo, hokey stuff that couldn't possibly make a difference. Well, when I was working in hospice care, because my patients were asking me questions, I would try to look up answers. I would try to find more information. And sometimes I saw people who did very, very well. I saw people who changed their diet and adopted a new type of diet. That's back when the macrobiotic diet was big. Um, I, they may not have had a complete cure, but they might have lived two, two and a half years, surprising their doctors and had better quality of life. I saw people using different touch therapies and massage and creative visualization who were, had much better pain control and anxiety control. So I saw these interventions working, but I also saw people getting tricked into using things that did not help them at all. I had an AIDS patient who was a professional photographer who had owned his own business in New York City. He had come back to the Midwest to die at the ripe old age of 39. So it was a very sad situation, but a very smart man. And he got tricked into buying a device that was a rubber band and the rubber band went around his head at night and it was attached to a little electrode that went to a battery pack. And the electricity was supposed to enter his bloodstream as he slept and kill the AIDS virus. And they only charged him $1,400 for that. So I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, I saw people doing wonderfully. And I started to think there's something to this. There are other approaches to health. There are ways people can reach their health goals, both with prevention, both with recovery, and also with treatment. At the same time, I said, there are people out there, the lowest of the low, that are trying to make a buck off of people's fear and desperation when they're at their lowest. How do you tell the difference between the two? So that's be careful what you look into, folks, because when you start getting interested in something and you start to explore, uh, next thing you know, you get sucked right into that world. And that's what happened to me. I became very, very interested in pathways to achieve wellness on their own or in conjunction with mainstream medicine to help people achieve their optimal health goals. So that was uh, 25 years ago. Uh, I moved into working in integrative medicine, worked in a variety of positions, 
uh, mostly with education and overseeing the science related to our expectations of how the product may work. So I always tell people, if you buy tennis shoes on the cheap, or if you decide that you don't, you, you want a, a small car that doesn't have very much get up and go versus a luxury vehicle, if, if you decide that you want the, you know, you don't want to spend a lot of money for crystal glassware, go for it. Awesome. Good for you, frugal you. Uh, but when it comes to things that you put in your body, those things become part of your body. They're used as fuel. They're used as building blocks. That's no place to try to cut corners. And that's a place where we need to do an incredible amount of research to make sure what we're using is moving us closer towards our goal and that we're not being tricked by some online vendor who makes enormous amounts of promises and then doesn't deliver. So uh, that brings us in a very roundabout way back to breast cancer and when looking at breast cancer awareness and breast cancer prevention and prevention of breast cancer recurrence. And there are many ways that we can help improve our immune system health. There are many ways that we can help assure either that we don't have a reoccurrence or that if we do, that we are able to live a long and healthy life, treating cancer more like a chronic disease instead of like a death sentence. I'm really, I, I think we can't have this conversation today without mentioning Suzanne Summers. Uh, Suzanne Summers was a movie uh, television star. Uh, she was in a situation comedy called Three's Company about uh, a young man who couldn't find a place to live and he couldn't find a place that he afforded to live. So he moves in with two girls uh, and all the hijinks that ensues with two girls and one guy trying to share the same apartment. And they, there was this beautiful young woman named Chrissy who had this gorgeous long hair and a very ample figure that um, all the guys were going gaga for. And, and so she made a big splash in that. And afterwards, she was also appeared in other shows and in other movies, and she developed breast cancer. And she had initial treatment. That's what people forget, that she had initial treatment. She had some surgeries. She did engage in some mainstream care, but then she diverged from it. She decided she did not want to pursue the traditional pathway. And she lived 27 years. She did die of breast cancer, uh, it took a long time for the recurrence. She lived a long and healthy life. Uh, she was able to, you know, interact with her kids. She had a wonderful relationship with her husband of almost 50 years. Many, many wonderful things. And now that she has passed, I see all these negative news stories. Oh, she rejected. If only she had adopted mainstream medicine. Uh, well, she did adopt some parts of mainstream medicine, but she also had other things she wanted to do, things she wanted to do with supplements things she wanted to do with exercise, things she wanted to do with diet that I do not think is particularly wacky. Um, she didn't tell people, ignore what your doctors tell you to do. She encouraged people to think for themselves. And, um, and I, it's sort of sad that, especially with cancer, because it's such a frightening diagnosis, that if we start to talk about pushing back a little and saying to our doctors, I appreciate everything you're doing for me, but it's my body and I'm in charge and I need to understand what's going to happen with these treatments. And I need you to understand that maybe there's changes that I wanna make in my life that I believe are going to help me, um, such as changes in diet, or maybe there's some dietary supplements that I want to use. And I'm a big believer in having these open conversations. And you know, if, if your doctor says, you do exactly what I say, or you're no longer my patient, um, it's up to you, but maybe you'd want to explore. Are there other practitioners that can help me be my guiding star along the way, but still let me bring up things and ask questions that's a little bit outside of the mainstream medical range? And I hear that all the time of people who aren't necessarily rejecting of mainstream care. Some actually are, I understand that, but who just want to have some basic information and professional guidance on um, you know, what can I do to make my chances better? What can I do to help my immune system be strong and really fight back against this problem? What can I do for prevention? Um, those kinds of things. Or maybe people who already are considered cancer-free that want to make sure they never, ever, ever have a recurrence. What are some things we can do? And there are a lot of things we can do from a natural health perspective to help regain our health and sustain our health uh, a lot we can do for prevention. So you would ask earlier, do men have breast cancer? 
they do, but the rates for women are one in six women develop breast cancer throughout their lifetime. The rates for men is one in 188. So a little bit different odds there. <laughs> so we do talk more about women when we're talking about breast cancer, but I do want our gentlemen in the audience to know uh, that yes, there are some things that you have to pay attention to as well. I think one of the problems we see, well, there's good news and bad news on the breast cancer front. The good news is we're doing a better job of keeping people alive and curing breast cancer. The bad news is there's more of it. So we've seen rates rise 20%. That's a lot. We've seen these rates rise, well, in our country. You're not necessarily seeing this in parts of Africa where they don't have a lot of the same food issues and uh, contaminant exposure issues that we do have in the United States. But, um, you know, we do see it's on the rise, but we are doing a better job. So fewer women are dying of breast cancer, hallelujah, but more women are getting breast cancer. And there's a, there's a couple of different types of breast cancer. Um, it's about over 50% of all breast cancer is detected when it's in the earliest stages. And women generally, many times can just have um, um, a surgery, maybe even a lumpectomy, where it's just where you take the tumor out without taking the breast off um, and not have to have an enormous amount of chemo radiation kinds of follow-up. But there are 50% that when they do discover that they have breast cancer, uh, their doctors are recommending a far more aggressive approach. So doing a better job of curing. Uh, unfortunately, we are having more of it. One of the issues I see that when we people ask, why are we having more breast cancer? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, we carry more weight. I am not blaming anyone who's carrying extra pounds. God knows I'm carrying some extra pounds and I know how hard it is to try to get down to whatever our ideal goal weight is. I don't blame individuals. I don't think it's weakness in character. I think that there's a lot of metabolic things and physiological things that we do not understand. I think there's a lot of changes that we have made to our food supply with our Franken foods that stimulate greater fat um, storage, that stimulate fewer calories being burned as energy and more calories being turned into fat. The list goes on and on. Uh, when you have more obesity, when you carry more fat on your body, you make more estrogen. And estrogen is um, a godsend, but it can also be a, a devil. It can also cause problems. So having too much estrogen on board because of obesity, because um, estrogen's message is grow, be free, grow, be free. That's awesome when you're 12 years old and going through puberty and you go from a stick figure to a gorgeous girl, uh, a mature woman. Um, that's wonderful. That's a great message to have. But it's not such a great message to have if you're 40 years old and you might have a couple of cancer cells in your breast. We do not want them to grow and be free. So modulating the sheer volume of estrogen that women are exposed to is, is a, a very good thing uh, in helping to keep it in its safer form. Another reason that we see problems is that high blood sugar levels uh, play a role in tumor development. So we talk a lot about type 2 diabetes and people struggling with their blood sugars. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that having excess blood sugar puts you at a greater risk for tumor development and high levels of insulin production puts you at a greater risk for tumor development because of some of the signals that they use to grow and be free. Um, when we look at cancer cells, cancer cells absolutely love sugar. And so if you have high blood sugar, you're feeding your body negative things that you don't want to deal with. So when somebody has a fasting blood sugar, that means first thing in the morning before you've ever had a piece of toast or whatever you have for breakfast, what's your blood sugar? 120. The doctors say, well, you better cut back on the pie. You better watch it with the soft drinks because a normal fasting blood sugar is between 80 and 100. I'm not that, I don't believe in that. I think if you are creeping up at all, things are moving in the wrong direction and you have to start paying attention to your blood sugar levels because it's a lot easier to get them back to normal when they're 120 than when they are 220. Now you're gonna to have to put a lot of medications on board and that sort of thing. So paying attention to blood sugar levels, looking at how many simple carbohydrates you have in your diet, 
I don't tell people to wipe them out entirely because I'm not sure that that kind of dramatic um, dietary change is sustainable for people to do all at once, especially if they're used to eating simple carbs. But I say, try to, you know, if you drink four sodas a day uh, that are sweetened with high fructose corn syrup, why don't you try to switch three of them to sparkling water? You'll still get the fizz, but you don't necessarily have the sugar pouring in. If you like sweet treats, uh, are there any nut or granola bars that have fewer of the simple sugars and more of the complex carbs that will maybe satisfy that snacking urge? So make, taking baby steps and playing and making a difference is important in blood sugar, helping with blood sugar. So those are some reasons. Another reason we're seeing this huge increase in breast cancer has to do with fake estrogen. Remember how I said estrogen can be a an angel or a devil? Well, and a lot of things in between. Well, we're exposed to fake estrogens. They call those xenoestrogens. Xeno means foreign. So it's not xena, warrior princess. It's xeno, meaning foreign estrogens. And these often, these come from um, industrial and manufacturing pollutants. So we all know we're not supposed to drink water out of plastic bottles that contain BPA, right? BPA stands for bisphenol A. But a lot of people don't know why. Why am I avoiding BPA? Well, I know it might cause cancer, but why? It's because BPA, bisphenol A, which is used as a plasticizer in plastic bottles, is a xenoestrogen. It adds to your body's estrogen load. Um, it's implicated in increasing your risk for all of the types of cancer that are fueled by estrogen. So yes, breast cancer, but also uterine cancer, uh, cervical cancer, and ovarian cancer. So there's, that's one thing to pay attention to. Um, there's other pollutants as well. Uh, things that are used in food that is not grown organically uh, to kill bugs. And, you know, one of the ways that you kill bugs that are consuming your crop, because a farmer wants to harvest the crop, they don't want to lose it to bugs. The way that you kill those insects, they use many of these are called hormone disruptors. And when you have hormone disruptors that are being sprayed on your plants to kill the bugs by interfering with their reproductive cycle, then guess what? Some of those gets into our body and they're endocrine or hormone disruptors in our human body as well. So yes, it's microscopic amounts, but you expose it over and over and over again, and you end up with more problems. So one of the first things to look at is what is going on in our life that increases our exposure to fake estrogens, what is going on in our life that is increasing the production of our own estrogen and getting those risk factors under control. There's a, a also, because my area of expertise is the use of dietary supplements to help people achieve their health goals, there's also a supplement that can be really, really useful for people who have more of the negative forms of estrogen. And it's called, are you ready for this? Because it's a long one. It's called methane, D-I-M, DIM. Now DIM is, a, is from cruciferous vegetables. So uh, those vegetables your mom told you to eat that you might not have liked as a child, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, bok choy, kale, these are all cruciferous vegetables. They contain compounds that when you chew them, and they're mixed with your stomach acid, metabolize into DIM, methane. So people have known for a very long time that cruciferous vegetables, having a lot of them in your diet, uh, help, to re help reduce risk of breast cancer and other hormone dependent cancers. So we have known that for a while, but now there's more and more research looking at what kinds of compounds are in these cruciferous vegetables and how can we use that to drive down the risk further. So the way that DIM works, and by the way, please continue to eat your cauliflower. Please continue to eat your broccoli. I'm not saying take a pill and don't eat your veggies because there's other really awesome things in those that also play a role in helping to stay healthy. But the DIM I find particularly useful. Um, when you use DIM in supplementation, the, the traditional dose is about 120 milligrams per dose of which 30 milligrams is DIM and the rest are, are um, compounds to help boost absorption. But when we find that with DIM, you would have to eat about two pounds of raw broccoli a day. 
to get the amount of DIM you can get via supplementation. And DIM does not raise estrogen. DIM does not lower estrogen. I call DIM the traffic cop. DIM stands in the road with the sign and waves the estrogen down the smoothest path. It waves it down the better road and stops a lot of it from going down the bad path, which can only cause problems. So by being able to shift internally how our estrogen, both the fake estrogens and our own estrogens that we make, what form they're in, being able to shift that more towards a better pathway plays a huge role in helping with both cancer prevention and cancer recovery and prevention of cancer recurrence. Um, there's also some interesting studies on DIM for cervical issues. And I'll just mention them briefly because our topic today is breast cancer, but they go together a little bit because they both have to do with estrogen. When a woman has a test called a pap smear, they're looking at, are there changes to the cervix that may be leading to cancer or have so many changes occurred that this person definitely has cancer? So when you get a pap smear, your results may be normal. They may be cancer, but there's lots of range in between where they say, uh, you have some cells that aren't normal. You have abnormal cells. So what they've looked at with DIM, because these abnormal cells are fueled by the dysfunctional forms of estrogen, uh, DIM has been shown to, when used in women who have abnormal cell growth, uh, in, that could lead to cervical cancer in reversing course and sending it back in the other direction more towards normal. So, so many things that we can do by using methane. Uh, daily. It's not something you take just when you need it. And not only is it one of my favorites for both prevention and prevention of recurrence with breast cancer, but I like it for a whole host of women's issues that have to do with what we call estrogen dominance. So, you know, perimenopausal and menopausal changes that are very uncomfortable, uh, PMS, menstrual migraine headaches, uh, women who have endometriosis, women who have uh, endometrial fibroid tumors, cervical dysplasia, which is what they call abnormal cervical cells that might be leading in the wrong direction. There's a whole host of issues that women have that respond far, that there's correlational studies and actual studies that have shown that DIM can make a big difference in helping to prevent these issues or and or helping to make them better. So one of my most favorites is methane to help women uh, who may be struggling, as I said, with preventing uh, recurrence or with prevention in the first place. Awesome. Um, so I was just double checking the chat to see if we had any questions. And I see that Elizabeth likes to make broccoli sprouts. <laughs> Stop, you're making me hungry. Uh, it's later here than it is where you are. So we've talked a little bit about methane. We've talked about the abnormal cellular development. There Are there other supplements that can help women prevent breast cancer? Absolutely. So when we see breast cancer, it's not just dysfunctional estrogen, it's also damage to the DNA inside our cells. So in our cells, we have a blueprint and our body uses that blueprint to make the next cell. Our cells don't live forever. Uh, the, the cells you have in your body today are not the cells you had in your body when you were five years old. Uh, they say that there's a complete turnover about every seven years. So if you did something naughty over seven years ago, it no longer counts against you. You have, you're an entirely new person. So yeah, all is forgiven. Uh, so our cells do turn over, but how do they do that? Well, they have to have a, a, an instruction booklet. They have to have um, our DNA, which is our, what we use to help make the blueprint for the new cell. Now, imagine if I'm building a house and I put a blueprint on my coffee table and I'm having a nice cup of hot cocoa and I set it down next to the blueprint and the dog knocks it over and hot cocoa goes all over the blueprint. And I sop it up really quick with uh, paper towels. Well, you know what? Areas of that blueprint might be smudged. And so what if I use those blueprints to go ahead and build my house? Maybe I build my house, but the area where the back door is got smudged. Now I don't have a back door. So does my house still function? Absolutely it does. Does my, uh, is my house gonna stay, stand as long as another house would make? Yeah, absolutely. Not having a back door is not gonna change how strong the structure of the house is, but it's gonna make it a little less efficient. 
it's going to make it a little more problematic. That's what happens to our DNA. With free radicals, they smudge that blueprint and the next cell isn't quite perfect. It has a little bit of a uh, not quite right. Uh, usually the cell is just fine. It goes on and does its job. But the more we damage the blueprint with what we with oxidative stress, the more we damage that blueprint, the scarier it becomes because if you damage the blueprint enough, guess what? You smudge out the part of the cell that tells you when to stop building. So you start to build your house, but you don't have any guidelines. And so you keep building and you knock down your neighbor's house, uh, but you don't have any instructions on when to stop. So you keep building and you knock down your back yard neighbor's house and now you've knocked down the block and now you've knocked down the whole neighborhood because you just keep building and building that's why cancer cells do their blueprint gets damaged and they don't know when to stop building so one of the most important things you can do is to prevent the smudging of the dna in the first place and we do that by using antioxidants we do that by eating a diet rich in antioxidant foods uh, and we do that by trying to reduce our exposure to things that create uh, that kind of oxidative damage in the first place, like smoking. Um, I'm not a smoker. Both my parents were smokers. Uh, I am fortunate that I absolutely hated it. I can still remember long drives when we lived in Michigan at the time where it's cold and all the windows rolled up and both my parents smoking, I'm not completely unaware of the, of the detrimental health effects. So when we look at smoking, smoking creates a lot of oxidative stress and smoking is associated with increased risk for breast cancer and other cancers as well, because it puts oxidative damage in our body that damages our cells and messes up our blueprint. But there are other things that can mess with it that you may not be as aware of. There's environmental pollutants, uh, sunlight exposure, excessive sunlight exposure uh, can cause free radical damage and lead to certain types of cancers. So we don't, you know, we don't want to avoid sunshine. We need it for health and wellness. It's silly to avoid sunshine, but we do want to avoid sunburn whenever we can. So lots of things can cause free radical damage. You know, a lot of the dietitians and natural health experts we hear from talk about eating all the colors of the rainbow. Well, they're not talking about Lucky Charms, folks. Uh, they're talking about fruits and vegetables that have a variety of colors because you need more than one kind of antioxidant to what they call arrest, oxidative stress, oxidative damage. It's not a one size fits all situation. So there are antioxidants and polyphenols and red kinds of fruits like watermelon is different than what you find in raspberry, but that's different than what you find in blueberry, different than what you find in spinach, different than what you find in oranges different than what you find in kumquats. Well, I know the list goes on different than what you find in broccoli. That, that's why we need all the colors of the rainbow is because there's more than a thousand different kinds of polyphenols with really potent antioxidant activity, some of them more powerful than others that can help protect that cell. So two that are particularly good when we talk about breast cancer are curcumin, which is from turmeric, the spice, and green tea. So green tea has compounds in it called ECGC. Uh, please don't ask me to pronounce it. And these are polyphenol compounds that have some very potent antioxidant activity that's highly specific to the kinds of damage that happen to breast cells with oxidative stress. So I really, if you like green tea, please drink green tea. It's the, I, it probably is the healthiest beverage on the planet. Uh, there, please do not fill it with 16 teaspoons of sugar. I've seen, uh, I remember one time I picked up a pre-bottled green tea and it was such a pretty bottle. It was aqua. It had like an aqua covering on it. It had this beautiful like Japanese woman and the, with the white face and the, the black rolled up hair and the, you know, just beautiful kimono. And I thought, oh, and this is all natural ingredients, naturally sweetened. And I picked it up and it had, yes, it had green, it was green tea. Uh, the amount of sugar it had was something like, it wasn't sugar, they put it in as honey, um, but <clears throat> it was like the equivalent of 12 teaspoons in one little beverage. It's ridiculous. So yes, do, do drink green tea, please do not sweeten it up too much. Um, then we have uh, my, my personal favorite, curcumin. So 
A lot of people have heard about curcumin as one of the top five best-selling supplements on the market today. Curcumin is awesome. So when we um, look at curcumin, it's a compound found in turmeric. And that's so confusing to people because turmeric is a spice and the media always talks about turmeric. Turmeric and its anti-cancer activity, turmeric for arthritis. But then when you click on the article and you actually read it, the study was not on turmeric. It was on curcumin, which is a compound found in turmeric. One of the problems with that is that while turmeric is a healthy food, it's not the medicine. So if you like turmeric, please eat it every day and eat it bountifully. Uh, but if you are using it more as a medicine to use it for a specific prevention, to help um, you know, prevent occurrence or to help you recover better, then I absolutely think you need to move from turmeric to the supplement, which is the curcumin. Turmeric only contains 2% to 5% curcumin. So I've seen companies on the internet selling turmeric in a bottle, which is by the way, cheap, cheap, cheap. A thousand milligrams of turmeric, a thousand milligrams in every single capsule. And then on the, on the label or in their marketing, they may say turmeric contains curcumin. Maybe they break the law and they make all kinds of disease claims for their product. You know, uh, this curcumin prevents arthritis, treats arthritis, prevents cancer, treats cancer. They might make all these crazy claims. But what they never tell anyone is that in a thousand milligrams of turmeric, you can have as little as 20 milligrams of curcumin. And as my grandfather would say, that's like spitting in the ocean to raise the tide. You're just not going to get medicinal levels of curcumin in your bloodstream at 20 milligrams at a time. Now, it is true that both turmeric and curcumin are hard to absorb. So using an enhanced absorption system is good. There's a variety of ways. My personal favorite is a patented method that uses turmeric essential oil in a process by which the flakes of curcumin are embedded with a small amount of oil. There are some other types of enhanced absorption curcumin, but regardless, pay attention to the dose, pay attention to how much curcumin you're expected to absorb if you want to match up to some of the studies that have been done. So I really do uh, love uh, some of the studies that have been done specifically on curcumin, uh, looking at, at breast cancer and how it helps to prevent breast cancer. Well, number one, it is a super potent antioxidant. I mean, super potent. So when the USDA measures the antioxidant activity of a food, they measure it in per 100 grams. So for example, um, blueberries are about an 8,000 ORAC value and um, dark chocolate powder is about 37,000. Ooh la la, because I like dark chocolate, right? Dark chocolate is an awesome antioxidant. When you look at our curcumin per 100 grams, uh, the antioxidant auric value is about a million. So when I say it's super potent, I mean it's super potent. So it is particularly good at helping people that uh, are having trouble with whatever, for whatever reason, they're having a lot of oxidative stress and damage to their DNA. Additionally, uh, in a cell study that was published in Molecular Neurobiology, uh, they found that curcumin on its own can reduce breast cancer cell replication by 80%. So there are some great preliminary studies and also some studies that um, are have shown over and over again curcumin's beneficial activity when it comes to helping with balancing out what's going on hormonally and helping to prevent cancer. So I really, really love curcumin. Another thing I love about curcumin and why I think it's indicated in helping people that are struggling with breast cancer or worried about getting breast cancer is that it facilitates detoxification. Now, remember these xenoestrogens that I talked about? And I said, you know, that the detoxification of, you know, that these compounds come into our body and they, they do things the wrong way. Uh, well, we want the way that the people that are the best detoxers have the least exposure. So if I'm good at detoxing compounds, which means I'm good at my liver grabbing onto, let's say it's BPA from plastics, bisphenol A. So it's grabbing onto it. So it prepares it for removal. Well, if my liver is kind of sluggish and not doing quite all that it should, that BPA is going to circulate a lot longer and increase its, its exposure to individual cells. So when we look at curcumin, curcumin helps increase bile production in the liver. 
Bile is a liquid. I call it the toxin taxi cab. Did you ever wonder how the toxins your liver grabs gets out of your body? Well, your liver puts them in a toxin taxi cab and then it dumps that bile into your gastrointestinal tract and the train leaves the station and takes the toxins with it. So by increasing taxi cabs, you increase the ability of your liver to get rid of these dysfunctional compounds that may be a risk factor for causing or worsening the issues that you're struggling with uh, with breast cancer. So I always love the, that aspect of it as well. So super potent uh, anti-cancer activity, super potent antioxidant activity, and also help support liver activity as well. So curcumin, in, a different, in, a, in addition to this, is the most powerful natural, natural herbal anti-inflammatory that I know of. There's a lot of herbs that have some mild anti-inflammatory benefits. Uh, curcumin trumps them all in my, in, in, from what I've seen so far. So when we look at curcumin and inflammation, you have to understand that chronic inflammation in our body creates a lot of oxidative stress. Chronic inflammation is of itself a cancer risk factor. So using this to help reduce that chronic inflammation can be so useful when you are putting together your own personal breast cancer prevention or prevention of recurrence protocol uh, using a good quality clinically studied. I prefer curcumins that have been used in published human clinical trials because then we know that the researchers have looked at it and felt that this is something they want to use in their patients um, and it passes all the quality tests and we wanna see how effective it is. The most expensive supplement you will ever buy in your life is the one that does absolutely nothing for you. So it, pay, it, it really pays to pay attention to the science behind certain claims that companies might make. Another natural compound that is extraordinarily useful in helping to prevent breast cancer and breast cancer recurrence and recovery is vitamin D. Well, you know, it seems so simple, doesn't it? Um, when you would think that we would have more naturally occurring vitamin D on board, but we do not. Number one is because we're not outside very much, we more people used to be in the olden days, more people worked outside than inside or spent more time outside than inside. Now, most people with jobs, uh, those jobs are inside. So you have reduced exposure to sunlight. You do not absorb vitamin D from sunlight. Vitamin D is made by your body after it's triggered by sunlight. So your vitamin D strikes your skin, it flips this switch in, a, in uh, your skin cells called melanocytes, and then they make vitamin D. How do you make vitamin D? One of the key compounds in making vitamin D is cholesterol. So when we have individuals that are taking drugs to abnormally reduce, get their cholesterol level to really, really low levels, we're gonna have less raw material to make vitamin D. Additionally, as we age, we are less able to make vitamin D from sunlight. Our bodies are still cranking along, but we're not making it quite as well as when we were 20 or 25 years old. Uh, last but not least, skin fat under the skin. You would think that people that have excess weight are better able to make vitamin D because more skin, right? It's the exact opposite is true. That extra thickness of fat underneath the skin interferes with the ability of the body to make vitamin D. Um, so really important to look at these risk factors and to supplement with vitamin D. Vitamin D is also great for cold and flu season because it boosts immunity. And there's some great studies on helping with prevention throughout cold and flu season, but it is also excellent to help prevent breast cancer. When we look at low vitamin D status, now, when you have vitamins, they can, you know, when we talk about low levels, you can have vitamin deficiencies. That's when they're so low, you're going to get sick and die. You know, like for example, vitamin C, if you don't have just a basic amount of vitamin C on board, you're going to get scurvy and eventually you're going to die of scurvy. That's the vitamin C deficiency syndrome. The vitamin D deficiency syndrome is called rickets. Um, and, it, and so we're not talking about people who have such a low level that they're actually deficient and, and coming up with a deficiency syndrome. We're just talking about people in the lower third of the amount of vitamin D that's probably optimal for optimal health. And what they found is low vitamin D status 
can increase your risk for breast cancer by 45%. That's kind of ridiculous. That's kind of ridiculous. They found that high, higher levels of vitamin D, those, those women uh, that are, have the highest levels of circulating vitamin D in the top third have a 45 to 50% reduction in breast cancer risk. So think about vitamin D, uh, think about vitamin D status. Uh, there was also um, a publication that did a pooled analysis of 11 studies. So they look at 11 studies examining the relationship between vitamin D and breast cancer. And they looked at uh, vitamin D levels. And these authors, after examining the results of these different studies, came out with a, their, the results of their research was that if women can keep their vitamin D levels uh, uh, at 47 nanograms per milliliter or higher, that we could reduce breast cancer risk by 50%. I am not aware of any drug that can so greatly reduce your risk for breast cancer. Um, so I think that it's, it's really important to, even though it's a simple thing to think about how to get more vitamin D into your body. I personally take a vitamin D supplement every single day. Make sure you look for the Coley calciferol form. So vitamins have fancy Latin names, right? Uh, and sometimes there's more than one form of a vitamin. There's two forms of vitamin D. There's uh, ergocalciferol, which is the kind you generally find in foods and some supplements. And that is, um, that's certainly okay. And then you have cholecalciferol, which is much more powerful. Um, it is utilized up to 87% better in the body. So if you're going to take a, a, a supplement, take, take a cholecalciferol form of vitamin D it will make a huge difference. So we've just talked about a few things. We've talked about curcumin. We've talked about green tea. We've talked about vitamin D. We've talked about reducing sugar in the diet. Just a few of those things. Look at the massive impact it can have on breast cancer risk. So any questions, Elizabeth, or anything that's come through or anything you'd like to go over more? I don't see any questions in the Facebook Live. Um, Jan, do you have any questions? Well, initially, it's been so informative. Thank you. Um, initially, you talked about being tricked into supplements or, or ineffective things. And right. some of the things I've seen lately, I wonder if you have an opinion. One is um, the grounding. Um, phenomena where where there are a pad um, that can go on the bed or can go on your um, there's a, a pillowcase there's mm -hmm. different products that um, and a man's written a book and there's videos so I'm curious about grounding is that can that be helpful they're talking about like the Native Americans who healed themselves by laying on the on the earth, the feeling that that energy was healing. Well, I don't know enough about it to be an expert or to give you an expert opinion. I do know that a lot of people have concerns about their exposure to um, electrical or electromagnetic kinds of waves, electromagnetic kinds of radiation and that they do believe that grounding helps to reduce some of the negative uh, activity. Uh, like if they live next to a cell phone tower or they have a lot of exposure at work. I don't know enough though about the science behind it to, to as I said, to really offer up a, a good opinion. Personally, I think that laying on the ground is an awesome thing <laughs> because I believe that um, many of us are quite divorced from nature and, um, I think that we feel better. You know, there's been those studies in Japan about forest bathing, where pe just by people going out in the woods and listening to the bird song and inhaling the scent of the beautiful evergreen trees and feeling the, the path beneath your feet and hearing the rushing waters can do tremendous things for our health. Thank you. And another advertisement that I've seen lately is, um, what's it called? Infrared saunas. And people have 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 a, have 
a structure and they have all there's all these pads things you can climb into and mm -hmm. it, this is supposed to flush out impurities it, they say anyway is there do you have any information? i have heard yes i have heard good things from people who use infrared saunas or infrared treatments uh but i don't as i said i, I couldn't converse with you about their scientific validity thank you thank you're you you're welcome you're welcome you know, and I'm so glad you're asking these questions, and I hope our listeners are thinking about that too. What, what is the science behind this thing that I'm putting in my body? You know, um, you, we've, you've heard of elderberry. I'm sure, Elizabeth, you've heard of elderberry. Elderberry is a wonderful uh, herbal product that we often use in cold and flu season. It has some great studies on antiviral activity. The, a company on Amazon got busted not that long ago for selling elderberry, that when they looked at it, it was white powder in a white capsule. How many people did they dupe? You know, so the, those of us who work in this industry know that elderberry is about as dark a purple as you can possibly get. It turned out, thank God it turned out to not be anything harmful. It was uh, rice powder inside of a capsule, but they were, and they weren't selling it on the cheap either. I think it was 39 or $49 for a month's supply because elderberry shot to prominence during the pandemic, there's only so much elderberry that's being grown. And so if they can't get the raw material, they, it doesn't stop unscrupulous companies from selling it. They just put white powder in and off they go. Another huge issue, you've heard me talk about curcumin and how much I love curcumin and what, I, what an amazing, amazing uh, compound it is. There is synthetic curcumin that has entered the market. And a recent, um, a recent study, I, well, how it was done, maybe it was 2022, so about a year ago, a year, year and a half ago, uh, looked at 11 different brands that were on the market and found that seven of them contained synthetic curcumin. Synthetic curcumin, I mean, that's like an oxymoron. How can you have a synthetic plant, right? So what they do is they construct curcumin out of petrochemicals so that when you run it through um, what they call an HPLC analysis, an HPLC analysis is like a picture of a compound at the, the peaks and valleys of what it looks like um, um, under an, on a molecular basis, and it, it caused the same pattern. So people would think, oh, this is curcumin. But when they test it further, they find the presence of the petrochemicals and know that it's not natural, it's not from a plant. So uh, you know that there's nothing, you know, there, everybody's heard the expression caveat emptor, buyer beware. Uh, it's important to pay attention to what you're buying and what kind of claims you're making and how those claims are substantiating. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you distinguish a reputable company? That's a very good question. I wish I could tell you it's because I they have me working for them, but that's not the answer. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer is you, you can't entirely just on your own. I encourage people to work with a really reputable health food store a natural practice practitioner that really knows their stuff because I do this full time and it's hard for me to keep up with who's legit and who's not. You need somebody to do some sorting before you ever even walk in, you know, instead of, you know, there's, there's thousands of different kinds of perfumes on the market. And blends. I, I look at the, just even at Marlene's, which I love, it's like, I feel like I'm self-medicating. I, the, you know, which, and, and could you, very slowly say the name of what DIM or is it D DIM stands sure. for? It went by so fast and I couldn't I couldn't hear it. All right. Die. The D stands for die. D I. D I stands for endolil. I N D O L Y L. Uh, excuse me. I what is it again? The I stands for it endolil methane is the for what the M stands for. Diendolomethane. Endolomethane. Yes, most people just go by DIM because it's surely a mouthful to try to say. And again, do you have a reputable brand or company or um, anything that you feel a reasonably comfortable um, recommending? Well, you know, the um, since we're doing this as a, an educational event, I try not to put branding in with an educational event. Okay. Um, so, but I'm just, but let's just say there are uh, ec excellent brands out there. I like DIM combined with curcumin and uh, um, grapeseed extract because grapeseed extract is also a super potent antioxidant. 
Um, so there are things out there, but that's why, as I say, I encourage people to go to health food stores, natural practice practitioners, people that really care about the education that do some background research. Um, I also another, it's not a trick exactly, but another way to help guide your purchase when you're looking at is something legit or not is has there been published clinical studies on it and be, and be careful because people throw those words around a lot. So when I talked about the curcumin that is, has boosted absorption with turmeric essential oil, that's the most uh, clinically studied enhanced absorption curcumin in the world. There's 90 studies on that, almost 90 studies and human studies of those, about 40 of them are human studies. That's a big deal. When you have something that has been chosen time and time again by researchers to really make a difference uh, in the patients that they're doing the study on or whatever kind of study they're doing, uh, that's, that's very useful. But one of the things I hate is I have a love-hate relationship with the internet. Um, so uh, one of the things I hate are companies that say, look at, I'll pick on curcumin again, look at curcumin, look at all the studies and the list of studies, but none of them were done on their curcumin. Or they'll make a, or they'll, they'll say, uh, in our own private study, which hasn't been published, but you can look at the results here on my website. I hate that too, because unpublished studies means it has not been what we call peer reviewed. You're just taking their word for it. You don't know how many people, you don't know what the conditions were. You don't know. And who, how and who paid for it? Oh, Oops. yeah. Well, paying for it isn't always a bad thing. Um, for example, no researcher out there is going to look at, for example, uh, does adding turmeric essential oil boost the absorption of curcumin? So there are companies that legit pay for studies to find out information. But you're right. Um, looking at how are they paid for, uh, are the majority of them paid for uh, because of uh, the um, NIH grants or through, through reputable research, or are all of them completely funded by the company? If the company funds a study, did they provide the money as an unrestricted educational research grant? And that's a legal term. That means that if, if Cheryl has a company in Cheryl's garage on Cheryl's supplement, and I pay for, and I pay a scientist to, could you test this for me? Did I give it as an unrestricted research grant? Meaning that he can say it doesn't work at all and that Cheryl's full of it um, and has no repercussions, you know, that they are able to publish. A lot of companies do participate in research, but it's restricted, meaning that if they get a negative outcome, they bury it. And it's not just the dietary supplement industry, you know, it's the drug industry as well. I mean, we could probably talk for a long time about how far a pharmaceutical company will, will go to bury some negative information on one of their prescription drugs or to try to prove that it's better than its competitors or how they do that. So, you know, it's sad that we all have to be little mini scientists, isn't it? But as I said, that's why it's important to create relationships with people who do this for a living. Um, and hope that they guide you in the right direction. Um, because, you know, I only use supplements from four different companies. And it's not because there's only four good companies out there. It's because those are the ones I know for sure. I have that information that I understand that they're okay. Are you, are you willing to put that in the chat? <laughs> <laughs> I to write it down for me because then I can go from there and research. It. You know what, Shan, if you would not mind contacting Elizabeth, I will send you all the information that you like, but we'll do it offline instead of. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. You bet. Yeah. Absolutely. And thank you. You, admit, you ask wonderful questions. Obviously, you know a lot about this. Well, I love living and um, yeah, I have had some, some serious surprises and I'd, uh -huh. I'd, like, I'd like to enjoy the life I have, yeah. maintain, maintain my health. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I um, struggle with a little bit, and I've seen this happen in working both in mainstream cancer care and also working in integrative medicine, is that people blame women for getting breast cancer. It's like, well, what did you eat? Or what did you do? Or did you breastfeed? Or did you not breastfeed? Or did you take birth control pills? Or did you? It's, it's just like, come on, people. Um, 
Sometimes people have do everything right and we don't know what's going on at a genetic level. We don't know what we're exposed to. That time we hopped on the bus and there was a funny cloud we walked through. I mean, how can we possibly understand every single thing that we come in contact with? We do our best. We, are, we do our best with lifestyle choices. We do our best with supplements. We do our best with voting to vote to for politicians that will help keep cleaner air and cleaner water and and reduce all the dangerous chemicals we're using in our food. There's we can do everything right and still end up with a problem. And I think that's time to stop that and start looking at solutions instead. Yes, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think we've watched that unfold with COVID. Mm -hmm. you know, first, they were trying to find whose fault is this. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can now you can get all of the all the boosters. Mm -hmm. you know, plus the food, plus the air. And still my sister and brother-in-law are in Germany and they caught COVID. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of factors. A lot of factors. My mysteries in life, yes, yes. But you, as you say, we do the best we can and try to support yes. the science and, the, and wonderful that you're willing to share what you know. Oh, well, thank you. That's so kind of you. All right. Anything else, Elizabeth? How are we doing? Well, we're doing great. I did have a quick question. So uh -huh. um, I've heard like some things where um, this article said that uh, breast cancer is not always like DNA related. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to know your thoughts about that. And then also, what are your thoughts about um, uh, transphaneous uh, vitamin C? Okay, so first, I'm not exactly sure what you're reading. And if you want to send it to me, if you find it, feel free. Um, I believe all cancer is DNA related. They might have been saying it's not necessarily in your genes. There's only a small Maybe portion. That's really there's only a small portion of people who develop breast cancer that is because of genetics, which is damaged. DNA you were born with. You know, we talk about the BRCA1, BRCA-1 gene. So that might be what they were talking about because all cancer has damage to the DNA that causes the malignancy to develop in the first place. Some people are just born with it, those unfortunate souls uh, that have to pay extra special attention their entire life long to all these factors because they have a higher risk because they have uh, genetic damage. It's a, a mutation. Uh, a permanent mutation. Um, and what was the second about intravenous vitamin C or what was it? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, intravenous vitamin C is good for a lot of things. Um, if a person is undergoing breast cancer treatment, chemotherapy, I would absolutely encourage that person to be working with a professional and not just going off to another practitioner and getting IVC because there are certain chemotherapies that it may not um, do well with. And I there are some dietary supplements that have some preliminary investigation about use with chemotherapy, use with radiation therapy that are incredibly promising results. So for example, with curcumin, every single study that's been looking at curcumin used in conjunction with a chemotherapy has found that it actually helps the chemotherapy work better. It's what they call a chemosensitizer. But has it been tested for every single chemotherapy on the planet? No. So then I'd be a little bit more careful then. Uh, there was a recent human study on multiple myeloma, 33 individuals. The only cure for multiple myeloma is bone marrow transplant. And a lot of times people can't have a bone marrow transplant because they are too sick, the, they're too old, the disease has spread too far. They can't find a candidate. There's a lot of factors why. And so the secondary goal is to call, put it in remission. Remission means the cancer goes to sleep. You don't have symptoms. You feel great for a long period of time until it wakes back up again. So they did one group uh, that had, that took chemo. It was a four week study. So half the people got chemotherapy and a steroid, the steroid to help push the immune system down because in multiple myeloma, you've got plasma cells and such that are kind of replicating out of control. Uh, the, the, actually, both, both groups got chemotherapy, both group got steroid treatment. Uh, one group got a placebo, one group, group got that curcumin I was telling you about that is curcumin with a turmeric essential oil boosted absorption system. 
at the end of four weeks. In the drug group only, 33% of those individuals were in remission, so one out of three. In the curcumin added group, 75% were in remission. Three out of four people went into remission. People that achieve remission in multiple myeloma on average live three times longer than people who do not achieve remission. So I think that is a magnificent study done in human beings alongside conventional treatments showing how an intelligently crafted dietary supplement with a lot of clinical literature can make a profound difference in people's health. And um, that one wonderful um, curcumin product, um, I use it almost daily and it helps my inflammation levels so much. I deal with a lot of inflammation and pain um, with my lupus mm -hmm. and the, um, the other product that has the Boswellia, mm -hmm. I'll use that when I'm, when I'm having a really bad pain day in conjunction with the curcumin. And it just, it, it gets me moving and grooving again. Well, you know what? I'm sorry you're dealing with this painful condition, but just think when you treat it using curcumin and or Boswellia as well, um, you get side benefits instead of side effects. So instead exactly. of side effects, like yes. so like, you know, if you're, if you're taking over the counter drugs, your side effects might be ulcers, raising your blood pressure, reducing kidney function, all these nasty things to get liver damage. You're getting side benefits like cancer, breast cancer prevention and Alzheimer's prevention, you know? So that's another reason why I'm not, as I said, I'm not against mainstream medicine. There have been a couple of times in my life, mainstream medicine saved my life. Uh, I always say, if I get hit by a pickup truck, please do not take me to an aromatherapist. <laughs> Please take me to the closest trauma center. Mainstream medicine does trauma really, really well. But there are so many times with why can't we weave this together? I feel like that. I almost feel like, why can't we all get along? Why can't we take some steps? I think we are bridging the gap. It's much better than it used to be. Much better. Why can't we be friends? Why can't we be friends? Absolutely. So I think the more we work with uh, re legitimately researched dietary supplements and achieve our health goals, um, and report that to the mainstream medical world, we'll start to see that change a little bit and be more, um, more understanding that there might be more to the world than just mainstream, narrow, wear your blinders kinds of, of healthcare. Definitely. Well, we're, we're, we're on our way to um, uh, bridging that friendship and we'll, we'll all be friends and we'll have that integrative health and wellness platform mm -hmm. for all. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for inviting me here today. Um, it's just been a delight to be able to chat with you all about something, as you can tell, is near and dear to my heart. And uh, we can do a better job to help people. We can do a better job than what we're doing. So thank you for helping to get that information out there. Oh, yes, not a problem. It's my absolute pleasure anytime I get the chance to work with you and looking forward to next year's schedule. Well, we're getting that um, in the books and working on it. So stay tuned, folks, for, for more wonderful classes with Cheryl Myers. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Mm -hmm.